right, how are you? How's it going? Thank you for coming out of this wonderful evening. So, I'm sick of Obama's wife. Yeah. This isn't some Republican rant either. It's just kind of first ladies in general. You know, I don't know what it is. All throughout my life, with each presidency, like these first ladies, they've just gotten more and more like, like, uh, like chatty. You know? More and more chiming in, like leaning into the frame, <laughs> spitting out their ideas. It's just like, well, why are you talking? <laughs> right? You weren't elected. Shut up. <laughs> Your husband's not running a lemonade stand here. He's running the country. You don't just chime in. Let me guess, is this considered sexist? <laughs> it is? Why? Well, okay, you just nodded there, lady. Let me ask you this, all right? Let's say you had a leak in your house, okay? You call a plumber up, he shows up, and he goes, yeah, I think the leak's coming from the upstairs bathroom, we need to shut it up, blah, blah, blah. Then all of a sudden his wife walks in, who isn't a plumber? <laughs> and then goes, hey, you know, I'm actually thinking it's kind of pretty nice, hey. Wouldn't you be like, with all due respect, shut the f up. I need a plumber in this moment. I'll extend an olive branch here. All right, at some point, there's going to be the first female president, right? Exactly. Which means at that moment, you're going to have the first male first lady, right? And when that happens, that dude needs to shut his trap. I don't want to hear a word out of him. I want to hear from the president. You, sir, go do some first lady stuff, all right? Go get yourself some gloves that go up to your elbows. Smile and nod during speeches. Go put your own flair, redecorate in the White House, right? Which leads you to Michelle Obama, right? And now she's sitting there holding up those hashtags. Remember that hashtag, bring back our girls? Remember that? It's like, I, it blew my mind. It's like, why are you showing me that? I'm a stand-up comedian. Like, what am I going to do to get those girls back? Why don't you look across the dinner table? It's like, you see that guy? <laughs> that is the leader of the free world. Tell him to pick up a phone, call some Navy SEALs and solve it. What, what am I going to do? <laughs> Show up with a sharpened mic stand. Hey, Michelle said to bring him back. <laughs> Oh, it's unreal. <laughs> I'll tell you what kills me. Hillary Clinton might run. She might, she might run. That, that blows my mind. I mean, honestly, she became a senator. She went from being the president's wife to being a senator. Just like that, lateral move. That's like Tom Brady's wife becoming the next quarterback of the Rams. <laughs> it's like, what, you hanging out? You just pick it up? I sucked at sports, and then I banged Tom Brady, and I don't know what happened. I just picked up a ball, I started lacing it. I'm leading receivers, it was incredible. <laughs> I knew it was gonna be like this. You know what's funny? There's actually people out there that think a woman being president is actually a good idea, you know? Can you believe that? See that they do? That'll do something. That'll change things. How? How the f is that gonna change anything? Do you know what the president makes a year? The president makes 400 grand a year. That's it. He's trying to keep billionaires in line, making 400 grand a year. That's all he makes. He makes less than some people blogging on the internet. The president should have right? He shouldn't be sitting there with his pockets turning and saying, I need, I need your help to get me, get me the job, right? What, do you guys all donate to the campaign? Is that what it is? <laughs> the band's enjoying it. Martha Stewart, not so much. But the rest of you, <laughs> enjoying it. They're just jokes, Martha. Come on, you got an empire. I'm rooting for you. Here's a fun game. Get out your Google, click on Images, and type this in, men marching against women's rights. There are a few pictures of a march in Istanbul with guys wearing dresses, but every other picture shows men marching with women for women's rights. No big demonstrations with men demanding that women lose their rights. Not in this country. Let's get a few facts straight. 
Men are bigger than women. Men are stronger than women. And until last century, men entirely controlled the government, the courts, the military, and the police. If women had had to fight us for their rights, how on earth could we possibly have lost? What really happened is that women said, we want to do everything that guys do. And men said, okay, not sure why you'd want to do that, but hey, whatever blows your skirt up. Here were millions of women coming out of the 1950s angry that they were expected to stay home with their televisions, washing machines, and station wagons, while men hogged all the fun of working for ungrateful bosses and sneaky tightwad clients. Yeah, the news that we'd been oppressing women came as quite a shock to us guys. We thought we'd been protecting them. Especially since for a long damn time, working meant swinging a hammer in 90 degree heat or clogging your lungs in a coal mine. Women weren't fighting for those jobs. No, it wasn't until the advent of the air-conditioned office job that women realized that we had them chained to the dishwasher. The basic lie of feminism is that men don't like women, that we don't want the best for them. That's the basic lie. More Google fun. Search the history of alimony. Was that something women fought for? Hmm, let me think. No! That's been with us since the Code of Friggin' Hammurabi, 1750 BC. Even the primitives were watching out for women. Oh sure, things were kind of rapey back then, but everything was crazier. It wasn't women who had to run off over the hill and catch a spear in the throat. It wasn't women who were chained to oars in the Greek warships. Being big and strong usually made you a beast of burden. But let's not go all historical here. I've done painting work for maybe 500 couples, and I almost always work for the wife. She picks the colors. She's the one I have to impress. In most of the marriages I've seen, the women are in charge. They're not oppressed. Look, from the first time that puberty causes us to lose our minds over a girl, we are helpless to control their influence over us. Why do we do the things we do? Why do we build cities and bridges and McMansions in the suburbs? So that we can get the best women. Period. End of lesson. All that a woman really needs to do is to stay attractive and feed her man's ego from time to time and she'll have a soldier with her in every fight. Feminists find that idea offensive. They think that's disrespectful. And speaking of respect, the notion that men don't respect women is complete madness. These men who were supposedly oppressing women in the 50s and 60s, who raised those men? Women. Remember, their dads were at work. It was mommy who cared for them. It was mommy who taught them how to act. We're trained from day one to rely on women, to follow their advice, to treasure them. Listen, if you want to leave little Emma with the hired help while you claw your way up the corporate ladder, be my guest. But first ask yourself this, who has more real power in the world? The female mid-level manager making 60K? Or the wife of the guy making 100K? Who is freer? Who is more secure? Who has more time for her children? In this country, women have the most generous package of rights and protections ever offered at any time in human history. And they're still taken to the streets in protest. Why? Why are they so unhappy? I'll tell you why. Because feminism has backfired. Feminism has gone horribly, horribly wrong. But this is only part one. I'll see you over at part two and we'll get into it. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, subscribe to our channel and then click the little bell to get notifications. Have you ever met a lesbian couple and been amazed at how masculine one of them was? Here are two women who say they have no sexual interest in men yet one of them acts like a man, and the other is attracted to a woman who acts like a man. The same is true of feminism in general. The whole thing is focused on the characteristics of men. They're mad at men for being men and cannot wait to do all of the things men do. Nature, or God if you prefer, made two sexes. You can't get away from it. It's fashionable to think that the sexes are interchangeable, but that's just nonsense. The two sexes have two distinct sets of talents. How could they not? Here we have one human who can grow a baby inside her body, 
give birth to it and feed it with a built-in snack bar. And over here, we have another who can do none of those things, but is absolutely necessary to getting that baby started and keeping that baby and its mother fed and protected. That's the balance as it was designed. But a two-person team is not enough. Humans need a tribe, and a tribe needs a command structure. When things get dangerous out in the wild, a leader with unquestioned credibility is needed, the alpha male. Every man wanted to be the alpha male, and every woman wanted to mate with the alpha male. That was human society for hundreds of thousands of years. But then things got complicated. We moved from wandering tribal bands to agricultural villages, to feudal societies, and finally to industrialized nations. And we got farther and farther from the type of world for which our bodies and minds had evolved. And all of the fighting and random mating that men do so naturally, we made laws against all of it. The new world order was, guys, guys, calm down. Act more like women. Yes, what we call civilization is modeled on the natural behavior of females. But you can't just shrug off a million years worth of instincts. So we bottled them up. The alpha male went underground. And most everything women find sexy in men got flattened out in the interest of nine to five consistency. The joyous impulsivity of the human male has been all but squashed. If we see it in a boy, we pump him full of Adderall. If we see it in a man, we order him into sensitivity training. Men are so lost. We come home from work, open a beer, and watch other men playing games that ape the turf wars of our hunter-gatherer past. How sad is that? How does a man excite a woman these days? How does the average guy throw off enough mojo to turn a woman's head? We can't all be rock stars. What we have is our work. That's how we display our competence. But now even the world of work is being taken over by women. A man's last claim to value in the tribe is being wrestled away from him. It used to be that a man went off into the world, did mysterious man things, and brought home the bacon at the end of the week. He was a hero every payday. But the feminists fixed that. Now women know that earning a living isn't magic. It's mostly thankless grunt work. The mystery is gone. Women aren't impressed with men anymore, and they don't care much about impressing us either. And we did most of this to ourselves. Men willingly took on lives of near constant self-denial. We did it for the good of all, and especially for the good of women. But that's not good enough for the feminists. They're out to get that last quarter of a gonad. They want the last masculine male to go the way of the T-Rex. Or at least that's what they think they want. But deep in the core of them, they long for that knee-weakening jolt of a real man who is truly in his element. And they've become convinced that those guys are out there somewhere in the tall buildings. And women are out to find them, to challenge them, and who knows, maybe even to be saved by them. Chew on that for a few minutes and meet me over at part three. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, subscribe to our channel and then click the little bell to get notifications. A while back, I worked for a couple in an LA suburb. They were about 40. The woman was a hard charging executive of some kind and the man was a stay at home dad. Every morning I'd arrive as she was just leaving. She'd be barking last minute instructions to her husband and he'd be in pajama bottoms and a sweatshirt with the baby on his hip. As I worked, I could hear the TV all morning and around noon, daddy would appear again with baby in a stroller and head for her play date in the local park. I worked till dark every evening and never once saw that woman come home. Undoubtedly, she was in traffic somewhere while her husband cooked dinner and baby watched videos from the playpen. Trust me, this is not a rare scenario. All over the Western world, women are slugging it out in boardrooms while their defanged hubbies watch The Little Mermaid and try to remember what it felt like to be a guy. We do logic here, so let's do some logic. How do you think she sees him? We've heard about how men feel intimidated and emasculated by powerful women, but what do these women feel about the men that their own power has done that to? What do you think? You think that after spending the day wrestling an account away from a competitor in some capitalist cage match, she wants to sleep with the man whose big triumph of the day was getting little Emma a good seat on the swings? 
House painting is not the most manly of the trades, but I think that sometimes having me around for a week or two sends these stay-at-home dads into a sort of depression. What could be worse for a guy than seeing another guy do the stuff his wife wants done while he pushes a stroller and changes diapers? I mean, that's got to kind of suck. As we said in part two, feminism is really just a perverse celebration of masculinity. And what it has done to the men and women caught up in it is to suppress actual masculinity in males while forcing women into an ongoing imitation of masculinity. Of course, there are lots of different scenarios. Many households now contain two mid-level execs, neither of which is very happy, or a man with some real earning power and a woman who's only working because she thinks she has to. There are lots of variations, but what I almost never see, at least in California, is a home where dad is the warrior leaving each day to slay the metaphorical antelope while mom does what a mommy does best, the educator, the nurturer, the homemaker. And all of this because some female academics back in the 60s were bored with the idea of motherhood. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, subscribe to our channel and then click the little bell to get notifications. A while back, I worked for a couple in an LA suburb. They were about 40. The woman was a hard charging executive of some kind and the man was a stay at home dad. Every morning I'd arrive as she was just leaving. She'd be barking last minute instructions to her husband and he'd be in pajama bottoms and a sweatshirt with the baby on his hip. As I worked, I could hear the TV all morning and around noon, daddy would appear again with baby in a stroller and head for her play date in the local park. I worked till dark every evening and never once saw that woman come home. Undoubtedly, she was in traffic somewhere while her husband cooked dinner and baby watched videos from the playpen. Trust me, this is not a rare scenario. All over the Western world, women are slugging it out in boardrooms while their defanged hubbies watch The Little Mermaid and try to remember what it felt like to be a guy. We do logic here, so let's do some logic. How do you think she sees him? We've heard about how men feel intimidated and emasculated by powerful women, well, what do these women feel about the men that their own power has done that to? What do you think? You think that after spending the day wrestling an account away from a competitor in some capitalist cage match, she wants to sleep with the man whose big triumph of the day was getting little Emma a good seat on the swings? House painting is not the most manly of the trades, but I think that sometimes having me around for a week or two sends these stay-at-home dads into a sort of depression. What could be worse for a guy than seeing another guy do the stuff his wife wants done while he pushes a stroller and changes diapers? I mean, that's got to kind of suck. As we said in part two, feminism is really just a perverse celebration of masculinity. And what it has done to the men and women caught up in it is to suppress actual masculinity in males while forcing women into an ongoing imitation of masculinity. Of course, there are lots of different scenarios. Many households now contain two mid-level execs, neither of which is very happy, or a man with some real earning power and a woman who's only working because she thinks she has to. There are lots of variations, but what I almost never see, at least in California, is a home where dad is the warrior leaving each day to slay the metaphorical antelope while mom does what a mommy does best, the educator, the nurturer, the homemaker. And all of this because some female academics back in the 60s were bored with the idea of motherhood. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, subscribe to our channel and then click the little bell to get notifications. A week after I graduated from high school, I moved to a sort of commune on the island of Kauai. For most of my late teens and 20s, I was surrounded on all sides by hippies of one kind or another. We had a lot of crazy ideas, but we all agreed on this one. Humans spend way too much time working our butts off just so we can have all the status symbols we're expected to have. I've never stopped believing that, but my generation sure did. I'm a free market guy. And I really don't care how much money you make or how much stuff you buy. You want to work an extra 500 hours a year so you can have a bigger TV or a better car? Knock yourself out. But don't kid yourself. That's consumerism. 
I happen to prefer a simpler life. In my mind, money should set us free, not lock us into a never-ending quest for more and fancier stuff. Apparently, the feminists disagree. Now that feminism has doubled the number of women out there in the workforce, there's a lot of money to be made. Now women must own a lot more clothes, shoes, and cosmetics. Most of the working women I know spend an hour getting dolled up every morning before they even get to the traffic jam. And that's not counting $100 haircuts and appointments with the Cambodian girls at the nail parlor. I think they call this being liberated. Men and women now pass each other in the hall on their way to more important things. Both are stressed out. Each is slightly pissed off at the other for not holding up his or her end of the childcare duties, the earning duties, and the romantic rituals. It's a human trait to justify whatever we do, particularly those things we do which require sacrifice, but which we feel like we cannot escape. A person locked into 60-hour work weeks must justify the all-consuming nature of his or her life choices. And that means more and more expensive stuff. You don't go car camping at Yosemite when you're working yourself half to death for your 150 k You stay at the Iwani Hotel. You roll first class. You reward yourself. No way are you showing up at the office party in a 15-year-old Toyota Echo like mine. That's not going to happen. Look, feminists are the female infantry of the American left. The left is doggedly anti-corporate, yet most feminists work for corporations. Not only that, they measure their success by how high they climb. What is this glass ceiling they talk about? It's a metaphor related to the corporate ladder. You're climbing the ladder and boom, you hit your head on the glass ceiling. If there's no corporate ladder, there's no glass ceiling. They are supposedly against an industrialized world and for a sustainable green world. Yet they crisscross the country in airplanes chasing the almighty dollar. Really, feminism is both super consumerist and super corporate. The whole thing is a full-on contest with men to live exactly the kind of lives that every lefty chick at the college protest swears to God she is against. Yet the minute they graduate, they're straight onto the treadmill and straight into the rat race. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, subscribe to our channel and then click the little bell to get notifications. You can go to any coffee house in LA or San Francisco or Manhattan in the middle of the day and 10 30-something guys will be in there working on their novel or screenplay. They don't have real jobs. Their wives have real jobs. These are the new men, men who will proudly tell you that they're feminists. I do fundraisers twice a year to help get resources to people in the developing world. The charities all know that if you make a microloan in Bangladesh, for example, you give the money to the women. The men will blow it. Women are the consistent ones. I know this bothers some of you, but let's glance back at our hunter-gatherer past for just a second. The women worked consistently, a little at a time, all day, every day. Men didn't. Look at the tribes that still live this way. The men do intermittent periods of highly focused activity, and then they lay around a lot. While women just trudge along, keeping busy with low-intensity tasks, childcare, food preparation, etc. The genius of Western civilization was that it paired as many men as possible with women and relied on each woman to encourage one man to get his ass up and out the door every day. A home with a woman and some kids gave every man a tiny kingdom. It gave his life purpose, and he was willing to work every day, even though it went against his nature. Feminism is undoing that just as fast as it can. In the 1950s, 95% of prime age men worked full time and 35% of women did. Yes, women were allowed to have jobs. Now 70% of women work and only 85% of men. That's a 100% increase in women working and a 10% decrease in men working. Now you might say, big deal. More men than women are still working. But you have to remember that it took hundreds of generations and a whole complicated system of rewards and stigmas 
to turn men into consistent daily breadwinners. And that has been substantially rolled back in just a few decades. All of the cultural programming since 1970 has been telling us that women like to work and want to work, and that men are of no particular value to society. Is it any wonder that perfectly capable men are staying home watching TV and playing Xbox or working on their screenplays? This video is way too short, but I'm tired. I need a nap. The old lady will never know. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, subscribe to our channel and then click the little bell to get notifications. Singapore, ladies and gentlemen, American Singapore. That's what I've been maintaining for a while now, and I wanted to have a little inside chat with the people that have made this show and all the other shows possible for all these years. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Bill Whittle here with Steve Green and Scott Ott, and this is your members only right angle for the week of um, winning victories and, and so on and so forth. I would like to talk a little bit about going forward. A lot of things have coalesced kind of at the same time. Um, I continue to work on this millennial project. Uh, and have gotten about 80% of the way all across the board. But we've had some major problems with the website. Uh, we think it was some kind of a cyber attack. Uh, we're trying to get those under control. We have a new website that will be coming out within, uh, certainly by next Monday, and if not sooner. Um, and we've been doing Bill Whittle now uh, with, uh, with Scott and I for th almost three weeks now, I guess, and keeping those coming consistently and so on. And the world is changing. And the reason I talk about Singapore is, is uh, this. Um, in, the, in the Second World War, uh, the island fortress of Singapore was the anchor of the Royal Navy, and they knew that the Japanese Navy was getting stronger, and so what they did was they built Singapore stronger and stronger and stronger, added more walls, more casements, bigger guns, until finally Singapore became absolutely impregnable by sea. As a matter of fact, Singapore was so well defended by sea that the Japanese Navy never even attempted to reduce Singapore. What they did was they sent the Japanese army through the jungle and they said that the jungle was impenetrable to vehicles, and it was, so the Japanese army came down on bicycles. And when they got to Singapore, Singapore fell instantly because the guns were facing the wrong way, and you couldn't turn them around. Um, and this is a, a model I think is very important. Uh, we have all, oh, let me just ask this as a question. Uh, Scott, let me start with you. We have always thought that tyranny in America loss of our freedoms, you know, all of the things that we hold dear, everything that the founders put in place, all of the checks and balances, all of these liberties that, that are enshrined and, and sacred to people like us. We've always thought that they were going to be taken away from us by people with guns. And so we have prepared ourselves for an assault by people with guns by having a lot of guns. And this is what I mean by Singapore. The loss of our freedoms and the loss of our ability to speak our mind is not coming from armed people getting out of cars or tanks. We thought that's what it was going to be. That's what it's been historically. But fortunately, we're fighting a nation of cowards, uh, and, and it's not coming from that area. I'm not asking you to quit your NRA membership, but I am telling you we have defended ourselves so well against the threat of physical violence that physical violence is no longer an option to take away our freedoms. They've got another option, which is the option we saw with, with Brett Kavanaugh. Um, it doesn't, I guess what I'm asking you, Scott, is this. It doesn't matter what form somebody uses to get you to shut up, sp speak when you're spoken to, don't have the audacity to disagree with anyone, tow the party line or else be destroyed. It doesn't really matter where that comes from so long as it's there and it is there. What do you think about this idea that this whole, whole entire conservative battle line is facing the wrong way and that, and that the politics of destruction come from telling stories on um, Twitter and Facebook, that that's where the actual battle line is. There's a, a saying that the military is always kind of preparing to fight the last war. And I think to a certain extent, the, um, the Republican Party is always preparing to fight something that they would do. Like we prepare for battle be mm -hmm. in the way that we assume that we would conduct battle, but we don't right. understand our adversary. This is why I've been such a, a, a continual and probably annoying uh, 
advocate of using those devil, devil's advocates questions. I've been doing this for years. And, and I don't know if you guys know this, but uh, I think you may. But years ago, when we were working for the other network, I heard a rumor that they were thinking about either replacing one of us or adding to our show a liberal because they felt like they didn't want to have a show that had just, you know, one point of view, essentially, in the view of somebody there. And that was when I really began to actively use the ideas of the left in the course of the show to, to challenge you guys with them. And, and, of course, you rose to the challenge. And I think um, we have insulated ourselves, not you and not the three of us, but as a movement, we've insulated ourselves from what the other side really believes. And we are spending much of our time fighting straw men. We are, we are setting them up and batting them over and feeling great about ourselves because we don't really understand how they're coming after us. James Madison and Alexander Hamilton and John Jay had the same problem when they were writing the Federalist Papers, because really the, the, the persuasive case they were trying to make in many ways was that, don't worry, this federal government is not going to be so big that it could come and, you know, march on Pennsylvania and take away our rights and our liberties by military force. It's not that kind of, of central government. And that's how they were trying to, to calm the nerves of the people who were concerned about standing armies, for example. That's why standing armies is mentioned, you know, that's a, that was a big fear for them. But what really happened and what Madison was wrong about, I think, in many ways, was he didn't realize that we wouldn't lose our rights involuntarily. We lost our rights voluntarily. We turned over power to the federal government. Um, and on a cultural level, we have embraced the left's vision for our country and our values. You know, there was this great scene in, uh, in a great leftist movie called Broadcast News um, <laughs> years ago. And I think I've, I've quoted this before, but Albert Brooks kind of goes off on Holly Hunter at one point and says, um, you know, you don't understand when, the, you know, he, she, he, he called uh, William Hurt's character the devil. And he said, uh, and she got upset. She said, this conversation is over. And he said, you don't understand. The devil, when he shows up, is not going to show up with like a red suit and a pointy tail, you know, with a pitchfork in his hand. He's just going to reduce our little by little, our values until nothing matters anymore. And that is what has happened to us. And that's what we have allowed to happen to us. And it's great to see a moment like the Kavanaugh confirmation when people stand up and say, you know, it matters that a man is innocent until proven guilty. It matters that we don't believe the accuser or the accused, but we believe the evidence. Um, and these kinds of things are what uh, energize people. And I think these are the kinds of messages that, that, that we need to get out. And these are the, we, we need to be willing to listen to the other side, not so we can agree with them at all, all times, although if we can, we should, but absolutely, but we need to listen to the other side so we can make legitimate arguments. Right. Steve, um, again, this is just for members. Um, and I, I'm very curious to read the feedback on this. Uh, certainly the people that are members here have a better appreciation of, cu of culture, you know, politics being downstream of culture and all the rest. But I think the country got a real serious wake up call with this Kavanaugh confirmation I don't think people realized, many people realized, how completely immoral and, and, and without any sense of honor these adversaries are. But as I say, what they're trying to do was they were trying to maintain tyrannical control over the Supreme Court, and they did it through storytelling. This is my entire point, right? <clears throat> they, didn't, they didn't try to bump him off. They didn't, they didn't you know, roll tanks into the, into um into washington they told a story about a man that they came that close that close to maintaining their tyrannical fear-based rule over other people they're not coming with guns they're coming with 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 stories and that means we have to fight back with stories and we have to fight back with people who understand how their story is constructed Conservative institutions are not uh, self-sustaining, but they very nearly are so, uh, and that's the nature of conservatism. You have built over time great institutions, and they tend to be fairly easy, in a, in a sense, to maintain. You look at this country, the progressives have 
been in charge of an increasing number of important institutions uh, for over a hundred years now. That is a long, long time. That is a lot of drip, drip, drip on the values that built this country, and yet the essence of America is still there. It's still there. Uh, whether you want to call it the the remnant, which I think is a phrase you were using a, a few years ago, mm -hmm. or a word you were using a few years ago, Bill, whatever you want to call it, the silent majority, that that, that foundation of basically decent, liberty-loving people is still there. It's still there. So how does the left survive? Well, they survive through this long march through the institutions, which officially started, you know, at the Frankfurt School in the 1950s, but really got its start with uh, the first President Roosevelt and his follow-on, especially Woodrow Wilson, who were, you know, the big harbingers of the left and the right of progressivism, which is just a, a, a nice word for statism. And this drip, drip, drip has, has had a big effect, but where does their real power come from, Bill? They've got a, a, a series of institutions, uh, entertainment, uh, the news media, and especially higher education, and increasingly uh, elementary school and, and high school education as well. These institutions all have, you know what they remind me of? If I can take another World War II analogy, Bill, th these institutions are their fortresses. They're, they're sort of a Maginot line uh, mm -hmm. to, to defend against a direct frontal assault. We can't just, how do you assault a university? <laughs> you can't do it. What you do is you go around it. Uh, Scott Walker, I think, showed part of the way in uh, in Wisconsin by going after their sources of funding because the left can't survive without right. public money it just can't uh, the deduct union dues deducted automatically from checks and stuff like that exactly scott walker went after them where it hurt the most and they howled he may not survive this next election we'll see i think i think the poor people of his state may have a little exhaustion not that they disagree with them but man it's you know there's been an election and a recall and now the re-election it's just it's 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 a lot for people to go through if they're tired of it well i don't agree with them but people are human uh so scott walker showed one way uh, uh kurt schlichter is showing another way which is by being just as mean and nasty as the left is. And, and the thing is, I know Kurt, and he's just one of the nicest, Real nice soft-spoken, funny, warm people you'll ever meet. Donald Trump is showing another way, which is you you play by their rule book. It's, it's win at all costs. And I don't always agree with his methods, but I love, I love the winning. And who am I to say that his methods are wrong, right? So we're, we're, we are slowly discovering these flanking maneuvers, Bill, and I don't know what they're all going to be. All I know is that uh, it might not be so much of a battle plan that's in motion, but it's, it's a series of flanking maneuvers taken by various people on their own initiative. And I think that in itself is the secret of uh, conservatism and, and liberty-loving people. We don't need a big, broad movement supported by all these public monies. We love our liberty, we love our country, and we're going to find ways, no matter what they are, to protect them. Uh, folks, the reason I wanted to have this kind of uh, behind the curtains talk with all of you is that it's been an interesting year. I've been basically working two jobs in addition to my political work here. I've also <laughs> been working on this on this entirely enormous thing, which has not been unveiled. And, and I know uh, that up until recently, it looked like I was, uh, you know, a little bit AWOL and maybe I was. And the website's old and creaky and, and all the rest of it and so on. But I just wanted to say this. Um, it's a strange confluence of, of events where our website finally became so untenable that we're getting a new one, much cleaner one, much better one, much easier one to use. We expect to have that during the week. It's also a little unusual that the first real Bill Whittle now that we did was one when Scott Ott called me and said there's, there are these new accusations against Kavanaugh. So those are the new shows. And they're the new shows because I've done so many firewalls, I don't really know how to state our position again any more freshly. I think what we need to be doing now is, is putting counter arguments directly again. We need, to be, we need to be shooting down incoming mortars as they come in. Um, and so all of this necessitates a change from where we were when we started. Uh, it's going to be a lot simpler and a lot easier and a lot cleaner and, and a lot of, of all of that. But the one thing that I'm that I'm hoping has happened, um, because we're going to do another membership push and we're going to ask you to continue your support under, despite the fact that we've had all kinds of problems, and, and to get your friends, is that I think what the Kavanaugh thing showed us was 
just how powerful the story is, how powerful, how, how close we came to losing that nomination. And if we'd lost that nomination, what encouragement it would have given these disgusting people to keep doing it and keep upping the stakes. Um, Kavanaugh survived because he told a better story than, than, uh, than Dr. Ford did. And during the Bill Willow now, as I lamented this, I said, I don't want to live in a country where the person who puts on the most convincing show of tears is the person who's right. I don't want to live in that country, but I do. I do live in that country, and so do you. And so we need people who understand the Japanese army that's coming through from the jungle and not the Japanese Navy that's sitting outside of the range of all our guns and, and the direction they're pointed. So um, this little shop of, uh, of, uh, little shop of honors here for us is, uh, is, is very important for me, for us, and hopefully for you. And we're looking forward to buffing it up because as we've been talking about this week on Right Angle, this is the first time in my political history where actual offensive action, taking background, going beyond the hold them or slow them down, actually going over to the offensive and starting to win back some, some territory. This is the first time this has felt really possible because I think the American people have woken up to the power of story and, and, the, and the damage and the, and that it can cause and the, and the power it has for good too. So we wanted to thank you very much for your continued support. We all genuinely do appreciate it every single day. Um, and you put up with an awful lot uh, during the years, and you'll probably put up with an awful lot more. Um, but, but it means a lot to us, and, and we're going to be doing our best to expand, to get more resources, to get these messages out there as much as we can, and we'd certainly like your help with that as well. Uh, that'll do it for our Singapore-based uh, uh, crew. We are... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> We're going to go take a little nap, and then, uh, <laughs> and, and, and in about in about 10 minutes, I'm going to shoot three uh, Bill Little Nows, uh, in addition to the five right angles that we shot today. Uh, it's absolutely fun. We love doing it, and we couldn't do it without you. So thank you on behalf of all of us, and we'll see you next week.